Let's thank God. Let's thank Yahweh. Let's thank Abba, the Father, Agape, Elohim, Eloha, the only God, the Most High, Yahweh, who put every thought into every head, who made the heavens and the earth with his fingers, who fashioned the galaxies in the Milky Way and Orion and Octoron, God, the Creator, the Father, Jehovah, the only God, the one who is a jealous God, a vengeful God, a man of war, and who is now going to gather his sheep, his children, those who believeth on me for the new Jerusalem. We are in, 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 we are in end times now. We see the tribulation progressing. And it's important to remember that we're not dealing with people. We're not wrestling with flesh. We're wrestling with principalities, invisible forces, the dark forces of the biggest loser on earth, Satan, the biggest creep, the most retarded creature that ever lived for Satan, when he was called Lucifer again, thought he would rise higher than the God of the universe and all the heavens who created him. So we're dealing with a hysterical, mentally retarded homosexual. That's why this is so funny. We know the answer. We know the ending. The ending is that we, the children of God, win. We destroy Satan in the lake of fire. So try to have fun with all this. We know the answer. It's a moot point. It's like a moot court. We know the outcome. We know that if we believe in God, that we will be in the New Jerusalem for eternity. So it's uh, tempting to get involved in politics, but it's really irrelevant because all of this will conduct to God's victory. And I want to read from the Holy Bible again. I want to continue with Genesis. It's important in these end times, it's essential before the rapture that we keep our eye on God. We should be communing with him all day long. We should be speaking to him in our brains. Remember, the prompts you hear in your head and feel in your heart, God wrote those on your heart. He's speaking to you. Your conscience is telling you what to do. That's God. So he's always there. He's inside of all of us speaking all the time. We don't have to go to church. Remember, religion is division. There is only revelation and relationship to Yahweh. Now, he's chosen certain of us prophets as the stumbling blocks to Satan. So you will see that everything I'm prophesying is coming to pass now. This is really the end of the world. And I've been speaking to several Christians about this and they say things like, well, they're not ready to go yet, but that's just fear because you must know that it's going to be an upgrade, an infinite, an infinite exponentially greater upgrade than what you understand now as the misery and the pain and the corpse that is earth. The world is a corpse. It's been dead from the start. That's why every day is filled with misery and depression, machines, all of this is disgustingly unnatural. Anybody who likes technology is satanic. You can see that as soon as you start arm wrestling with your computer every day to try to get something done, to fill out some online form, it never goes as planned, correct? That's because it's satanic. Satan rules the internet and he owns technology and invented machines. Sorry to keep reiterating this I just God opens some of our eyes to, to the truth and, and some of y'all he doesn't acknowledge and, and most of you are sheeple most of you are sheep who are going to wear your masks and continue believing the horse manure that you're fed by the media which is not true the world is run by satanic transsexuals by literal literal transgender freaks who sold their soul to the devil and had these operations because they want to remain because the powers that be, the Illuminati, want them to remain ashamed with this secret that they've had sex change operations. Remember, God confounds the wise with the foolish because 
the supernatural seems absurd, and it is absurd, but again, God made it that way. It's a test. And I am the word of God, and that itself is ironic because the word of God cannot possibly be reduced to a human, I, his only begotten son. You're, you're never going to believe that I am who I say I am, and that's what God wants because it's impossible to believe. Even I can't really believe it. It's too much of a burden. It's too much of a cosmic fact to grasp, including my mind. I know that it's true in my heart. I've always known that I am the Christ, but my mind can't quite accept it. So therein lies the duality, and the duality was only created by sin. It had been one before then. The world and the universe had been holy and pure, and we see this spelled out over and over again in the Bible, and, and most pronouncedly, most saliently in Genesis. Notice the irony in Genesis. It has to be ironic, because no amount of words can reduce the inexorable splendor of the creation of the universe. No word can do that, but it has to. And therein lies the test of faith. So it's built in to the nature, to the fiber of existence. So let's resume, please, with Genesis 11, chapter 1, uh, line 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and that's marijuana. And this is why God wants everyone to be using cannabis. Cana, abyss, cannabis. It's all tied into the, to the jargon and the language and the lingo of the Bible. God's making jokes here, but he definitely wants everyone to be using marijuana because that leads to revelation, to speaking with God. And that's why all the sheeple, mostly the Caucasians, fail to understand God because they do not use cannabis. So there we have it. Line 11, Gen chapter one, Genesis, God is advocating the use of marijuana. I'll, I'll read it again. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, another word for marijuana, and herb yielding seed after his kind, another word for marijuana, whose seed, I am the seed, sorry, I'm getting lost, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, I'm sorry. Yes, that is the next line. And the earth, and the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. There's another ironic line from Yahweh. He made the stars also. Oh yeah, by the way, he made the stars. It has to be absurd. God is funny. He's ironic. This is all funny. We are supposed to be having fun with this. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. 
And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And notice the the reiteration of his kind. That's God's kind. He's making everything, he's making us, man, in his image, Deus, um, Deus Amago Deus. But he's making every creature in his kind, meaning it has the characteristics of God. That's why you can see God in a leaf. You can see God in a beetle, an ant, because there's the incredible organization and everything has blood. Every creature has blood. The blood of the cross, the sacred blood. And here we go with one of the most important lines, obviously, in the Bible. 26, line 26 of Genesis 1. And God said, let us make man. Now notice us. That's the Trinity. That's I, the Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit. Let us. So here is the first instance of Elohim, the triumvirate. Although those, those words, those trilogy words are never actually used in the Holy Bible. Again, line 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Notice fowl is early introduced on the first page of the Bible. Don't think that God is not an organizer. He's the great organizer. Sorry, I keep... I keep um, Losing my place. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Notice that's line 27, the sacred 27. And that, I believe, is the most important line in the Bible, line 27. We'll say it again. And praise be to the glory of Yahweh. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Notice the staggering symmetry and beauty of of this poetry and the music of it. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. That's iambic pentameter. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. You see the irony? And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And notice again that good is the adjectival of God. Chapter 2. And here is the little synopsis that the satanic forces of the Book of Mormon inserted in in the front of this Latter-day Saint edition of the Bible, which other than the Book of Mormon is... It's completely wonderful. The creation is completed. God rests on the seventh day. The prior spirit creation is explained. Adam and Eve are placed in the garden of of Eden. They are forbidden to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam names every living creature. Adam and Eve are married by the Lord, the first wedding. 
Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day. And that's actually Saturday. So we are not to worship on Sunday. We are to worship on Saturday. Anyone that's going to church on Sunday is technically a heathen. And this does not mean that you're going to go to hell for these, for these infractions because you've been misinformed. God is all about intention. If you willingly defy him, then you're defying the law of Yahweh. But if you don't know something, if your eyes haven't been opened, God hasn't opened your eyes to it. So whatever is existing and whatever is happening in your life is God's will. Accept it. Remember, every thought in every head in every creature in the universe forever and ever has been put there by God. There is no free will. There is only election. And most of you sheeple, he has elected for Gehenna. Okay, so here we go again. Chapter 2, line 3, Genesis. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. And every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. And then we know, of course, that the first man to till the ground, um, the first men were Cain and Abel. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust. Sorry. Sorry about that. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that's line seven, importantly. And I'll read that again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice that is line 9, the satanic 9, good and evil. 10, line 10, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which is compatheth, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, There is Bedellum and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittikel. That is which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So Adam is the first gardener. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Never before has there been a more important warning than line 17, Genesis 1 of the Bible. Let's read that again. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, there has never been a more explicit directive in the history of Yahweh's universe. And yet, as we know, 
woman, woe to man, discovering some great new food, of course, as women do, convinces Adam to commit the original sin. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man, it is not good that the man should be alone, or is it actually? I will make him an helpmeet for him. Great. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Now notice that God veers away from that point. So God tells us that he says, okay, it's not great that I have my, my, my first man alone, so I'm going to bring him a woman. And then, perfect cliffhanger, God veers away from that tremendous fact and talks about again digresses there. That's a great cliffhanger right there in chapter 2 of the Bible, the first cliffhanger. <clears throat> Actually, it's not the first one. I mean, there, there, were, there were several other before, but that's the first major cliffhanger. By the way, God's going to create girls, and yeah, we'll get to that. So, again, funny, ironic. It has to be. Okay, Yes, so line 19 again. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And even that's ironic because God knows what Adam's going to call them. God already wrote it. And God's going to put those thoughts in his head. So the irony is rampant because it has to be. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an helpmeet for him. Back to the woman. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Excuse me. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, woe to man, because she has taken because because she was taken out of man. Notice that line, taken out of man. I'll let you infer the meaning of that because I don't want to be uh, intentionally insulting, but think about the, those that, that wording about that verbiage taken out of man. Line 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And that's why divorce is such a horrible sin. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Essential. Chapter 3, the serpent, Lucifer, deceives Eve. She and then Adam partake of the forbidden fruit. Her seed, Christ, will bruise the serpent's head. The roles of woman and of man are explained. And now I'm bruising Satan, and he's hysterical. And again, notice that some of my videos have like four views. They don't have four views. They have billions of views. But Satan's making it look like there's no views. Classic Satan manipulation. He's so angry right now. Oh, Satan's so bad. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so her seed, the Christ, will bruise the serpent's head. The roles of woman and of man are explained. Adam and Eve are cast out of the Garden of Eden. Terrific. Adam presides. Eve becomes the mother of all living. And notice the word even that God uses throughout the Holy Bible. Even, Eve, like God will say, and even to the depths of the sea and even up to Dan and to Bathsheba, meaning Eve is the extreme and even, if you notice all these words are tied in, many of them are cognates and that's God. That is the word of God and I am the word made flesh. Now the serpent was more subtle, and that's not spelled as the modern subtle. That's S-U-B-T-I-L, subtle. Think of that, subtile, under the earth, the most evil, disgusting, dirty thing. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now subtle has come to mean 
nuanced, but it doesn't really. It means under and evil and below. Garbage, where garbage goes. Satan is garbage, Gehenna, the trash heap. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, Eve's big mistake was talking to this creep. Any woman who knows better when talked to by a creep in, out in the middle of the wilderness will run away because she knows that the creep is dangerous. And yet Eve actually tries to rationalize with this retarded creep. And anyone, that brings about the point, anyone who pretends to like snakes is faking it because they're terrified of snakes and they're pretending to be tough. You know, like slashes, snake pit, etc. Nobody really likes snakes. They're man's mortal enemy, obviously. So I went through this snake collecting phase when I was a child, and it was all just conquering fear. Of course, we loathe snakes and we want to stamp on them, as I stamped on the snake in the garden as of Gethsemane in my first incarnation. I've killed many snakes in this incarnation metaphorically and figuratively and literally. But I'm yet to kill the greatest snake, and I can't wait to throw that snake into the lake of fire, Satan. Okay. Again, sorry, line two. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, yes, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, ye shall not surely die. What fact is that? Based on nothing. He just outright, is right there is the stupidity. He gives no rationale. He says, No, nah, you'll not die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Oh, great, great to know evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Line 7, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, this is interesting because it seems to me, as far as I can remember, in the fiber of my being for eternity, that God was walking and appeared at that point to us. And he will again. So let's keep our eyes closely on the pros because herein lies so many secrets of God's universe. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden, as if they could actually hide. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And that's metaphorical, meaning where he knows where he is, but he's, where art thou in relation to me, to God, to Elohim? Where art thou? So obviously he knows where he is. God knows where he is. But here God relies on the nuanced subtlety of language, of his word. And he said, this is Adam speaking, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, and and God said, who told thee that that was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Obviously, God knows that he did eat. God's testing at him. And God is also cheating a little bit because he wants to spell out for us in the word what happened because he can't infer. So, again, just by the fact that the word has to be written is absurd in itself because God already knows the answer. So it's redundant. 
And in, in a sense, the scriptures are redundant because God wrote the scriptures in our heart. We know what's right and wrong. So all of this is God having to reiterate these simple truths to the sinners. Again, line 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I command thee that thou should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Adam throwing the woman over the bu- under the bus. Of course, men blaming, blaming their wives for everything as we do. It's the woman's fault. It's your fault. It's your, honey, it's your fault I'm poor and not earning money. You're not feeding me well. Men, we men always blame everything on women, of course. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And that's why childbearing is so horribly painful. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. That's the postpartum depression. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. And there's the incredible, horrible iniquity that women have to rely on men who are pigs. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall I bring it forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, from dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The great cyclical resolution right there. Line 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And let's stop there. And let's praise Yahweh. Um, It's important, I think, to read the Psalms every now and then because David is such a fan of Yahweh. And we're reminded that God wants us to sing his praises with cornet, with harp, with all manner of instruments. This is what he loves. This is what he wants. This is the point of existence. Praise be to the glory of God, Elohim, the Abba, the Father, the only God, the all-being, the great